the show. Uh, is when you want to find out what Alan's done professionally, you don't go to all music. No, you don't. Uh, you could, you would find some stuff, but it would tell you that Alan stopped working a long time ago. You don't go to. Uh, you go to IMDb. You go to IMDb because Alan uh, makes pretty much every movie that you went to see in the last 10 years. Okay, fine. Not everyone. 98 percent of them. Fair. Um, so like, let's just let's just do a quick list like this in case you haven't. Uh, Jumanji, Star Wars, Fallen Order, Gemini Man, Angry Birds Movie Two, The Lion King, X Men: Dark Phoenix, Brightburn, Aladdin, Captain Marvel. That's just 2019. Just that's just 2019. And then uh, we could spend probably the the whole the whole show. Talking about his Whoa. Oh, is that me? Is that me or you? I think it's you. Well, why? I'm just I'm just doing my normal thing here. Um, we we it's not it sounds like we have an RE two hundred one by UAD uh, <laughs> on on the first setting without the reverb. Um, okay, let's see if it. Let me um let me switch to headphones. It works just fine when we were chatting before, of course, because there's no justice in the universe. Hold on one second. There is very little justice in the universe. Yeah, we're very aware of that. One second. Um, I think it's I'm too loud, so I'm gonna I'm told I'm too loud because I have people who watch. By the way, you can go on all music too because before yeah. the films there were about 250 albums that I, I went to, on I'm, and all the film soundtracks. So there's a few pages on on all music also. So I confirm that it's you, my friend. Um, you you are the one giving us the the delay. So should I put on headphones? Yeah. Oh shit, that's harder than you think. Oh boy, but this is kind of fun though. Um, it's How about kind if of... I just lower it a little bit? Oh, How's that's that? great. Yeah, that works great. Oh, now yeah. I can't hear you though. Ah. Let's it's see how that goes. goes. Okay. Is it's it still coming back? Yeah, it is. You should put headphones. All right, hold on. Everyone, don't go away. I'll be right back. Hold on. You know what? To entertain everybody, I'm going to just go down the list because it just entertained me to no end. So we did 2019. Let's go to 2018. 2018, Aquaman, Robin Hood, Roth, Roth Breaks the Internet, FIFA 19. That's a video game. Uh, Spider-Man, uh, The Predator, Animal World, Hotel Transylvania. Truth of Dare, Prospect, Five Figures, to, and then let's go to 17. The Greatest Showman with Greg Wells, uh, Jumanji again, um, Thor, Blade Runner 2014, nine, love that one. Dark Tower, Dunkirk, Wonder Woman, Pirates of Caribbean. Wow, you were busy in 2017, Alan. What's that? You were pretty busy in 2017. Yeah, I've been, I've been pretty busy since 1994. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna talk about all that uh, as soon as you have your stuff together. Oh, Deadpool! Love How's this? It. Is this better? Yeah, way better. I have a big delay. That's part. That's part of the problem. Okay, now we're perfect. Are you okay? No, because I have a delay that's like two seconds. Mm. Um, okay, I I sign out and sign back in. Yeah, you should do that. All right, let's try that. So let me kick you out, and then you can. Well, no, you sign out and come back in. Meanwhile, I'm going to keep reading this list. Um, let's see. Uh, Sing, Brain on Fire, Hidden Figures, amazing movie. Uh, Terminator, Genesis, Halo 5, the video game. I played that. Avengers. I mean, this is insane. When does he sleep? That's my question. Uh, let me see if I can find him again. Sorry, guys. This is the internet. And as you know, the internet is broken. Uh, let's see. Um, here he is. Connect. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's awesome. Alan Myerson, invite on the screen. Hello. Hi. I still got the two second delay or one second delay. Um, but we, I, you're perfectly synchronized here. So it's on your side. Yeah, I'm, are you using sure Chrome? What's that? Are you, Should I go to use, my cell phone? See if that works? Yeah, that's great. Do that. Okay. All right. Let's move to 2016. 
Uh, <laughs> if you go back uh, to 1999 and 2000, that's when the, the you know the if you get to the Chris Nolan movies. Okay, I'm 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 going. So I'm going to start from the bottom. Okay, you ready, people? 1994, Renaissance Man, Speed, uh, Man of the House, Bad Boys, Crimson Tide, Nine Months, uh, 95, Something to Talk About, Assassins, The Rock. The fan, the preacher's wife, the sex man. My goodness, man, this is insane. And Z. Um, I think you, I have a feeling Alan met someone. Let's see if he shows up. Hi. I see you on your phone. I see you on your phone and I hear you very well. And how about that? That's fantastic. We are in business. I love it. All right. So, Alan Myerson, how is it possible that you've mixed? I don't go to the movies very much because I'm too busy, but you've basically mixed every movie I've seen in the last 20 years. How's that possible? How does how does one become so ubiquitous? You said you made 200 records before you started mixing movies. I did. Uh, so how do you transition and how does that work? Well, the transition happened for me. I honestly, my record career, when hip hop started happening, I, I started losing steam in the record business. I didn't really identify with, uh, I didn't, I mean, I liked a lot of the hip hop I was hearing, but I just didn't know how to make it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I was working at Larrabee at the time and Dre took over the building and I actually kind of lost my room. And I was just sort of floating in midair. I didn't quite know what was gonna happen. And, just circumstances landed me in the film business. But um, the interesting thing was I'm an orchestral engineer, uh, orchestral musician. So it was really like the perfect place for me to land. I, I sort of identified with it almost immediately. I'm very, very comfortable in front of a recording session with a hundred musicians in it. And I learned how to do a lot of that when I was in New York doing jingles in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, so when, when it happened, I felt like I was, just the right, and then, you know, Hans at that time was sort of breaking new ground with the way he was looking at film score and mm -hmm. film scores being more like a record. And and uh, so I think it was just a good marriage at the time. And so we did a lot of films together in those early days. And then through the years, my career expanded beyond that. And uh, I've gotten more clients and, and so, yeah, it gets busy. I, I, how do I do it? I've been through two marriages and, and uh <laughs> well, we can talk about albums. that that's very interesting because that's the yeah. stuff that's not that's not discussed a lot yeah. um it's hard because... on the personal life it is I right i think i think the music business in general and anything media i think anytime you're you're working with a debt that's deadline intensive where you know where the next day you have to deliver and stuff like that it's just hard you know there's there were times where i remember that there were movies where I literally couldn't leave for a few days because just the way it worked. When we did Black Hawk Down, they started out uh, with the March release and ended up pushing it up to Christmas because of 9-11. And they felt, you know, as, as a company is supposed to do, they felt that they could A, get into the awards picture, B, the country could use a movie like Black Hawk Down, and C, you know, Mark financially benefit from getting it out faster. But they don't care, you know, the, the head of DreamWorks or, uh, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer, who I've done 17 movies with, he doesn't care if it, I have to stay up for four days in a row to get it done. Mm -hmm. So you do it, you know, and, and uh, if you don't do it, someone else will. Mm -hmm. you know? So you got to do it. And so that was so a tough one. We can we can come back to relationship advice after. I think it's of value. Yeah. This is what I like to do on this on these um, on these broadcasts. Is I like to geek out as little as possible and to do yeah. as much of the other stuff that we can't do on pure mix or that you don't you, information you can't find. But right. so so you were mixing records and um, yeah. and then you met Hans Zimmer in a corridor somewhere. Um, so, uh, something like that. Yeah. Yes. And uh, and he said, hey um, hey. Um, I need to mix it to mix a movie. And you said, sure. Uh, well, almost. I mean, I, I had met the people that ran Hans's studio and uh, they, we hit it off. And, and uh, actually his engineer at the time, who was also his partner, 
was from New York, from a studio that was in the jingle business. And I had this sort of reputation for, it was very hard to get out of the jingle business into the record business in the eighties. And, yes. and I was able to do that. So because of that, I had a little street cred when it came to, uh, you know, you know, it took a lot to get you to make that jump. So the guy who was Hans's engineer at the time remembered me from that. So we hit it off. I did some projects there and then I hadn't worked with Hans until they needed someone on a Saturday. They called on Friday night and they said, well, can you do this session? You know, usually I'd say no. I had this weird thing in my head that if I looked too available, people would think that I was too available. So I usually <laughs> wouldn't take sessions for the next day, but I figured, ah, maybe this is different. So I took the session um, and it was, uh, I had already done some work at, re at, at the day it was called Media Ventures. Uh, uh, for the for Hans that he wasn't involved with, but this was a session where he was producing and uh, Penny Marshall, who was the director, was this movie called Renaissance Man, 1994, and uh, and uh, it was a drum percussion session and and I nailed it and and uh, he loved it. He left because he realized I could handle it. And once Hans is comfortable with knowing that shit's going to be good, he's on to the next thing. You know, you were tracking. And you were not mixing. I was tracking. Yeah, and and so I tracked that. And that was, and that worked out really well. And then I ended up mixing it and then I did the next one. And, and then I think the thing that really uh, sold it, no, I don't mix sound effects also, Adam. Uh, I think the thing that really sold it was um, we were doing this movie Preacher's Wife mm -hmm. and I wasn't even involved yet. And they were having trouble because it was a, it was a musical and they were having trouble getting the songs to sound the way Penny was the same director wanted it to sound. And, and um, so Hans called me and goes, feel like working for free tomorrow. I'm like, why? He goes, we need you to, we, I need you to like demo some mixes for me and see if you can get something that they like. I said, sure. You know, so I came and I mixed some songs and they loved it. And uh, so I, I got the job and then I was, I did the score and then Penny who grew up in Brooklyn and I grew up in Brooklyn and, she, she liked me, she identified with me and asked if I would be willing to do the, the dub, which is basically the re-record, the guys that do dialogue and effects and mix it with music. So in those days, they had a three man stage. They had a music guy, a dialogue guy and a sound effects guy. They don't really have that anymore. Um, so she asked if I wanted to do that. I had never done anything like, I didn't know what the hell, I didn't even know what the terminology was. And so I said what I always say, I said, sure. And I show up and they, and the guys, the guy running it was the head of Tadeo, which was the company that was the, ran, you know, that owned the post-production facility. He said, we'll give you all the time in the world to learn what to do. I said, great. Half an hour later, he goes, you ready? I'm like, yep. And, uh, and I did the movie and it was, and it was, you know, sounded great. And Penny was happy. Hans was happy. And I think that's when Hans sort of realized this guy can, you know, step up and do whatever it took. And so our relationship was pretty solid at that point. And then through him, I started meeting other clients and he had people that came up in his ranks, John Powell, Harry Gregson Williams, who's still a client, uh, many fantastic composers. And then, you know, I met other people and then started happening was the reputation preceded me. And I, I had, you know, like, like all the guys that do what I do, no one, no one sitting in that chair, you know, on a $200 million movie, with a million and a half dollar score, unless they know what they're doing. I don't care who you are. And if you, if you do, you only do it once because you'll, you'll get busted. And, and uh, so I started getting more work outside of that world. And, uh, and that's what happened, you know, so. So it's a, it's a high responsibility job. Um, yeah. You know, I was saying earlier, it's like music mixers, they're whiny uh, yeah. pansies because what yeah. we have to deal with, um, I mean, we have to deal with a lot of egos but the, there's not as many moving parts and there's not as much financial pressure as there is in a movie. Um, yeah. um, at least there's very few gigs that have that available these days that have that pressure. Yeah. It's, it's like small business. But I think it would be very um, interesting, if you will, um, to break down the different things because it can be confusing. You know, you can track, uh, you can track the score. You can mix just the score. You can mix 
uh, there's the ADR stuff, the fully fully ADR, right. and then there's the mix to picture. So those are all different steps. If you right. if you could take a few minutes to explain the arc sure. of how from the moment the composer is the ink is dry on the score, if there's a score, to the to when it gets to the movie, all the different steps, because I think very few people know that. Well, there there was a, there are three very big and very different departments going on there, and I'm not really. I don't do dialogue and sound effects. That's not my thing. I'm just a pure music guy. I, I, there were times where I thought maybe I would do that, but then all of my friends who were the best dialogue and sound effects mixers in the world, what we call dubbing mixers, mm -hmm. or the credit on the screen is called re-recording mixers. Mm -hmm. um, they said to me, you'd be crazy to do this when you're as good at what you're doing there. I mean, all of them wanted to be music mixers, except for the fact that they get the Academy Awards and the music mixer doesn't, which is, don't get me started. Um, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. Or I'd have seven, because seven of the films I worked on won the Academy Award for Best Sound Mixing, but they don't give mm -hmm. it to the music mixer. Don't get they me started. They only give it to the, well, okay. So describe the different steps so people can have a right. picture. So, so oh. but to take you through the music part, when when I the, the steps coming up to the delivery are, are pretty dense. In other words, the composer, almost everyone now is sitting in front of a computer and programming. Everyone's sitting in front of Logic or DP or Cubase or Live or whatever, you know, com composing there. And then it goes out to an orchestrator. Now I get involved sometimes at that point, you know, when they're starting, it, you know, sometimes Hans and James Newton Howard used to do it a lot. He'd say, hey, you know, I'm writing, I'm, it's, it, I'm getting what I want. Could you come in and tweak my template and make it sound a little bit better. So the stuff I write sounds a little bit better. And so I would come in usually late at night and do that. You know, that would be like my 1 a.m. gig because I have to let them write and then I come in after and they, I help them get a sound and then we go to orchestra. And then once we go to orchestra um, and I go to mix then I have to deliver the music as a, I wish I could share a screen with you, but I can't because uh, I'm actually in the middle at home of mixing a Netflix movie where I'm delivering 20 to 7.1 stems and i'm sure a lot of you know this that we deliver in stems so we're delivering a full mix but that full mix has to be delivered with a lot of the elements separate for many many reasons the basic being is that that you never know when they're done editing so you have to give the music editor an opportunity to be able to edit the music um to whatever picture changes there are. Sometimes the picture changes are ridiculous. They're like one frame out here. We get what's called a conform list. And that shows you where they've removed six frames and five feet and you know, four frames and two feet. And then you have to you have to cut your music to match that. This is a music editor's job, but I do a lot of my own music editing. So I get to do this a lot and then figure out a musical solution for doing that. So you, that happens nowadays in the modern world where everything is being edited, you know, uh, in Avid, you know, people aren't cutting film anymore. That can happen to the very last minute. So you don't want to give them that uh, mm -hmm. locked in. So we give them, uh, we give them a lot of flexibility. But if they put all the faders at a straight line, what we call a yardstick mix, if you put a yardstick up, mm -hmm. that if and then they play that against the full mix, it's exactly the same. So unlike you guys in the record business, which do a ton of mastering on the stereo bus, I can't do that. My mastering has to happen on the stem buses. And then the stems have to add up to the full mix mm -hmm. exactly because mm -hmm. that's the way it works. So So we do that. And then that gets delivered to what's called the dubbing stage. And on the dubbing stage, now there's usually two mixers. It used to be three mixers. There's one guy whose responsibility is purely dialogue. And then usually he's the guy that's also mixing the music. Now the music he's mixing is pretty simple because I've already mixed it. And what his job is now is, and, and you know, I get to work with the best dubbing mixers. My two favorite dubbing mixers in the world, I get to work with all the time. I'm not going to mention their names only because if I say their names, then some other guy will be listening to this and go, I thought I was your favorite Duffy mixer. I don't want to get into that. So, so, you know, they now have the ability to turn down, say the high percussion and the cymbals a little bit, if it's getting in the way of the gunshots, you know what I mean? So that mm -hmm. they don't have to turn down the music just to clear the gunshots. All they do is turn down the cymbals to clear the gunshots. And that's really the value 
of giving them stems is the fact that, you know, my job is to make it so that they can play the music as loud and as proud as they want to, or as hopefully I want them to, without uh, compromising the music where they can adjust a solo instrument, say, if it gets in the way of dialogue, or, you know, a big drum if it gets in the way of a car crash boom, or something mm -hmm. like that. You have to give them that sort of control. And then there's another guy whose job it is, is just to do sound effects. And that sound effects is a big job. You have the what you know all the sound effects that were created live during the shot, which isn't actually that much. Then you have what's called foley, which is the stuff that's created in a studio with people with shoes on their hands and breaking glass, throwing bowling balls into water and punching meat and stuff like that, which I get to do sometimes with Hans because we do a little bit of foley to create sounds for his music. Um, and and that last stage is where that choreography, that dance happens, where everyone finds like where they sit, you know, obviously like mixing a record, what's the most important thing on a record? Everyone out there, answer that question. Fab, answer what's the most important? The vocal. Right, so for me, the most important thing in a movie is the dialogue. It's exactly mm -hmm. the same thing. Yep. So when I'm mixing my music, I'm constantly listening to the dialogue because I wanna make sure the stuff I'm doing is is, making the music happen without getting in the way of the dialogue so that they'll have to pull it down. Uh, well, the kick and snare, yes, I see your comments in there. <laughs> the snare is important. It was much more important in 1991 than it is now, but it's still pretty important. Yes, Chris Lord Algie, we love you dearly. Um, and, and, uh, um, but the dialogue is king, you know, yep. and everything has to clear that. So unless there's a moment where it becomes, they make a decision, this is a music moment. Now, Chris Nolan, who I've done seven movies with, he is different about that. He he likes dialogue to sit in an environment where it would sit in the real world. So on a film like Interstellar, if you're driving your car through a cornfield, you're not gonna hear a lot of dialogue because people are screaming at each other, but you hear the sound of this old truck and corn. So at that point, you know, music becomes the thing that drives the show or in Dunkirk, you know, the pulse becomes the thing that drives the show. So there is some creative filmmaking where those rules, you know, Terrence Malick on Thin Red Line, and you know, breaks those rules where you go, where you f phase everything out and you go into a music moment. And that's the beauty of film is you can do all that stuff. Because when you add the visual medium to it, you become, you have the ability to create incredible sonic landscapes that you don't, that a pop record you could never, you know, that's why I love what I do, because I'm involved in, in this big, beautiful, you know, uh, magical thing that is, you know, I love mixing pop records sometimes, but, you know, you have this pop records give you certain rules that you have to follow. And yeah. this is much less about the rules. So it's less about the rules, but there are a lot of steps. And so There's a lot of steps involved. Yeah. So so the the so just to summarize in case people haven't followed the comp you held you held the composer express up the demos so that they they, they not not even the demos the the mock-ups but also mock the writing that he's going to do that's going to survive at the end there's always yeah. going to be programming that survives there's going to be percussion yeah. that survives there's going to be like the score i'm doing now is all synth and yeah. my job on this one is to they worked in stereo and I have to make it surround. So that's a big job. Is We're going to talk about to, that in a second. Yeah, yeah. how to yeah. magically do that. Go ahead. So so for those of you who didn't get that, the mock-up is today composers don't just de deliver a piece of paper. They actually deliver a demo of the orchestral score done with uh, synth and MIDI and Vienna and stuff like that so that the, the, the director maybe have a temporary thing to, to cut to and also so that everybody is absolutely sure that when they drop uh, however, hundreds of thousands of dollars on the orchestra and the session, uh, nobody is upset with how the music sounds. So that's an extra step that used to not happen in the back, back in yeah. the day, correct? Is that a good description? Well, I mean, back in the day, the orchestra was super important also. It's just, it was everything, you know? So, yeah. so your scores just were all about, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 40s, you're, mm -hmm. and, you're, and there was no mixing. The mixing happened when you were recording the orchestra live so it was a different world in those days okay so you do you do the mock-ups um you uh you mix the score and stamps then you right we, i record i help them set up to record the solo instruments 
I help mm -hmm. them determine the sound sometimes, you know, okay. not, not all composers want that. Then you mix, a lot of the time. You, you mix all the right. music, then you deliver I that. I record the orchestra myself. That's awesome. I do. I record. I'm, I, I like, I'm a pretty good recording engineer. I, 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 I'm very comfortable recording an orchestra. That's probably the thing I like to do the most. Um, okay. I've been to, I've been to Abbey road 25 times recording scores and, I'm a regular on the scoring stages here. Most of the money I invest, I invest in microphones and amplifiers. You know, so I have 125 microphones and, you know. We can so. race, let's race. No, yeah. you probably win. Yeah, I don't yeah. do vintage mics, by the way. I'm not a big vintage mic guy. Oh, I'm, I'm so many vintage mics. They're a pain <laughs> in the butt, but they're- They, they are. are, I just, I can't risk it because you, you know, it's you $50,000 every three hours when you're recording a score. Yeah. If I have a mic go down, it goes down for 10 minutes, do the math. Yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. Um, so, and then you you had, and this is a question I have for you. So you you spend all your um, you spend time, energy, and love creating this score, which you deliver in stamps to someone else who's gonna, and I'm gonna be technical here, fuck with it after. Um, how do you feel about that? I feel okay when it's the right guy. You know, when I feel okay when when it's a collaboration and we're all working together and we. And the, you know, fortunately, I've earned you know the respect, and so when I send something, people are going to listen to it and you know respect what's going on. But the fact, in in, in a, you just it would be overly egotistical for me to think that there isn't going to have to be some mixing involved when they get it and their deal. When we did Gemini Man, uh, which I mixed in New York, and I mixed in Atmos, and one of my best friends on the planet, Ron Bartlett was doing the final mix. He's definitely one of the best mixers I've ever worked with in my life. And I get into the mix and I see that he has to do a little bit of frequency work on some of the synths and some of the, you know, but he's doing it like, like, you know, he is respecting everything and just looking for shit that's getting in the way of whatever little details he's getting in the way. And he's in there with a fab filter. Like I have mine set up the exact same way where I've already like preset six points in there and, I could just grab and move and find the honky spot mm -hmm. and remove it. So when you stick that in with dialogue and effects, it, it brings up other issues. You know, that's yep. why you have to give them control because if I was, if I was on the stage, I would be making choices like that. Right. So, it's, so, uh, it's so, so, so the answer is I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to collaborate in the right environment and I go crazy when you get a dubbing mixer who does not respect the music or has this concept that they're going to fix everything. Yes. And before you know it, your guitar solos in the surrounds. And right. you go, what the fuck? I had this dub once where I had, I gave them this drum loop and I'm hearing all this mess and I'm hearing all this mix. And I, I said, and I'm at the dub and, and I got, um, I said, do me a favor, solo, solo the, the drum loop. And there's like a four second reverb on the drum loop. And I'm like, why is there a four second reverb on a drum loop? Oh, it sounds great. Believe me, trust me, it sounds great. So I, uh, I call my I call my music editor. So I said, okay, we got a problem. We gotta we gotta rework this. And you know, I you've, then you're in a battle. You fight the battle. You win some. You lose some. Uh, and so, okay, so I have a I have a, a philosophical question after that. But yeah. first, let's finish the process. So this new team handles your work as the dialogue and the folly uh, stuff and that right. all gets mixed to surround and that's all gets delivered to uh whomever is going to conform the whole thing into a final product correct is the mixer, so so it goes to a stage and and then on that stage they mix their individual stems and then that they print the separate units they're called and mm -hmm. so that there's a music unit there's a dialogue unit there's an effects unit and there might even be a foley unit or something like mm -hmm. that and then they do something that's called a print master where the, everything the mix is done they sit with a zero level and they print it down to one single unit and that's the unit that gets delivered to whatever the particular format is be atmos be 7151 dvd so on and so forth so why not bring the gentleman who just spent X amount of weeks mixing the music to the dubbing stage to adapt his own mix to the to the dialogue and to the folly? Why not that? Well, well the, the the answer is both about economics and it's about time. So, so nowadays the way you know since since the days of digital film editing have become the way of the world, 
nothing is ever what's called locked. There used to be this thing called the locked picture. When the editing was done, the post-production had started, nothing was going to change, and you could go from there. And in that time, usually the music is mixed and done before then, then you could do it. And that's how I ended up doing Preacher's Wife. But that doesn't happen anymore. The composer is always pushed to the end. So I'm mixing while the dub is going on. Okay, so they're they're mixing. I, I'm they're mixing real three on Wednesday, and I'm mixing real three on Monday and Tuesday to deliver Wednesday morning for them to mix it into the movie on real three. So I'm mixing real three while they're dubbing real one. Okay, and that happens 100% of the time. I mean, the last movie I ever did where we were done with our mix before the movie started was probably Gladiator or something like that, which we recorded on analog. I mean, at Air Studios in London. So uh, what, what's but, happened? what do you mean? What happened? Well, is it because there's the possibility of um, doing more changes that they are taking the possibility, even though it's putting the whole team on? Because music you... movies have gotten bigger and louder and 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 more and complicated and more labor intensive as the years went on, as everything else. I mean, look at if we had this conversation just about music making, right? Mm -hmm. So about the time I was doing Gladiator, if you were mixing forty eight track music, you, that was a lot. You'd be on two thirty three twenty fours locked together. Yep. That would be what you would call a big mix, right? Yep. I'm dealing with music that has three thousand tracks. Okay. okay. Let's talk about okay. that. And and I mean not every time, but a lot. Like this this little tiny score that I'm doing now. Uh, if I look at my system usage, I'm on 220 tracks. I'm on 220 tracks, right? And I'm printing 21 7.1 stems. Okay. So that process, like everything else, and now multiply that by dialogue, multiply that by effects. Multiply that by the fact that now, thanks to Isotope and RX, they can clean up that dialogue and they can clean up that effects and all that and add all these things together. And everything now takes more time than it ever took before. The product being, at the end, if you're good at what you do, a very high quality product. Or yep. if you don't know what you do, a mess of technology. Yes. Right? Um, so, so. Yeah. So you said three. So when you get the on a typical big movie, right? When you you're working out of your home right now for obvious reasons that we won't discuss. But when you're in your natural environment, habitat, um, yeah. your how many tracks is your average session on a big movie, and how do you handle that? There's no average. I mean, it, it depends on the movie. You know, it, like Star Wars: Fallen Order, it was just an orchestral performance at mm -hmm. Abbey Road, so it was 80 tracks, but Okay. you know with choir and everything like that but um you know the the biggest was uh without a doubt inception that had almost 3000 tracks and How i had you... to do i had to premix i had it was it's all about premixing it's all in the premix it's all in the right, you mix in two stages you mix you macro mix and then you micro mix mm -hmm. but even at that point at the end of the day i was probably on you know now pro tools handle 700 tracks mm -hmm. i uh, half of the stuff I do has 700 tracks and then I print to a second rig. So it's big and, and it's big because um, it's not necessarily that there's 700 individual unique things, but if say, I, say it's a, a um, it's a score that has really kind of a complex in, uh, orchestral stuff. I could have 10 passes of orchestra, right? And each pass of orchestra is 50 tracks. Mm -hmm. So that's 500 tracks right there. Then you have the sample orchestra, which no one throws out anymore. Mm -hmm. Pre-records, the synths, the solos, the sound effect. You know, it's just, you know, you get it. And uh, yeah, the, to be clear for, to everyone, the 10 passes of orchestra don't play at the same time. They might. Uh, all 10? They might, absolutely. I mean, well, not necessarily all 10, but you, have, you might have, there are guys that don't do this. Like Henry Jackman, we record the strings, the woods and the brass together and then do the percussion separate so yeah. that is a different world but which i kind of like that world because if i can get into the percussion ask me this question later well how do i get my percussion punchy yes you, know, you can really make stuff punchy if you record it separately yes um uh but you know you might have your short strings which in film music is, is a lot of time the motor what we call the ostinato 
Oh. It's, the, it's, it's a repetitive figure that continues. Yeah. And it's like the hi-hat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then you have the long strings and then you have on the brass, you have the big low brass and then maybe the French horns are playing a melody. So there's four passes if you're doing that kind of score. If you're doing a score like Transformers, you're doing a score like Pirates of the Caribbean, you're, you can't, there's no such thing as an organic balance that's going to work in a film like that because it's such a hybrid of production and orchestra that you have to be able to put everything on an orchestra under your fingers on a fader. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're doing Star Wars, you don't need to do any of that because it's a piece of music, you know? Mm -hmm. So you record it once, the mix takes no time, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so you're done. It, but the, the, that's the, not the world I live in a lot. You know, I live in yes. the other world quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, not, you know, like Jumanji is a perfect example. Jumanji, is a, I'm very, very proud of Jumanji, right? And and uh, so that's the strings, the woodwinds, and the brass together, one pass, and then all of the percussion separated, so that we can get into it with. And there's no samples, everything is just live, but it's been live. It's been Alan Myersonized. It's been, I've, you know, the percussion has decapitators on it, and mm -hmm. the microphones have been adjusted to. A, accentuate the punch and I've been using transient designers and there's a bunch of compression and this processing that's gone on, you know? Mm -hmm. so. so, so, um, so, and that, that's possible because you are at the inception by being the tracking engineer. If you were not a tracking engineer, you'd be fixing a whole bunch of stuff. Like you basically have the vision from the first moment of what you wanted to sound. At yeah. The end. But a lot of times I'm not the tracking engineer. So y yes, that other scenario does happen quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Now, usually the guys, you know, you've been doing this a while. Most of the guys that are sitting in the chair have a lot of experience. I know most of the people, you know, mm -hmm. so it's it's not um, it's not unlikely that I've done it before with Jeff That's Foster. Right. We've probably done 75 movies together. And, you know, uh, most of the time, if it's in L.A., I'm recording it. But sometimes in London, I record it. Sometimes in London, I don't. Usually if it if it's a. Uh, in one of the Eastern European environments, or or like yeah. I haven't been to Synchron in Vienna yet, so they they have a fantastic engineer there who records everything that that I work with that comes from there. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, cool. So all so, all so, scenarios are 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 in play at any given time. So um, so when you have a so I think this was very valuable for a lot of people because I know from I know this because I I was involved in a few movies not. Nothing like that, but I did a, a couple things with um, Mark Shaman uh, for um, I did all the vocals for um, Hairspray the movie, the musical. I um, love Mark. Mark is uh, the he's, best. He's absolutely wonderful, yeah. uh, and so I know the process because I was in it and I was subjected to it. Uh, so you for, probably worked with my friend Frank Wolf. No, I didn't. I was. He, he mixed the songs in Hairspray. Right. Well, I he, I sent probably sent him sessions. <laughs> um, but, um, so, um, so I know the process, but I know from talking to people around me that it's very blurry. So now it's been unblurred. So here's a, here's a practical question. You have 3000 tracks. Well, let's just say you have a session with 700 tracks. Okay. Right. Me, I have a system that I have, uh, we're going to nerd out people because people want to nerd out. Um, yeah. I have a session. If, if I complain about a session, it's because it has 120 tracks, right? Right. And somebody was being a pain in the ass. Right. Um, um, how do you find a snare drum? What's your system? Well, usually for me, the snare drum is an orchestral snare drum, and it's played by three people in a room. Yeah. And, and so it's right there as an orchestral recording, which I have an interesting. So, so what I, it doesn't, it, it happens in two stages, okay? Yeah. There's the stage that where I take, I really do think of it as macro mixing. So I, I take, I macro manage all the stuff. So say I find the snare drum, my snare drum is an orchestral snare. I, I make the sound I want mm -hmm. on the snare drum. And even at times I'll commit it so that I'm not running all of the DSP and everything on that. <laughs> I've now committed that sound. And then if I need to get back into it, I have to unwind it and redo it. But usually I get it right. And then with the snare drum, I actually have this thing I do. If any of you have followed me through the years, you'll know I duplicate the committed track and drop it a half an octave and mm -hmm. blend it in because I mm -hmm. like that low girth on the sound. Yep. And I find it works better doing that than EQ. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so then now I have the snare drum, which is a, a, it becomes a single thing. 
So yep. even if it was 25 tracks, it is now one thing mm -hmm. and it sits on one fader and everything is like that. I don't care. 700 tracks be could become 35 things. Mm -hmm. So now I'm mixing in 35 things. Now, when, when I used to sit with Hans a lot and mix, Hans is a very good mixer. And sometimes we'd mix together. He doesn't really, he's too busy for that now, but I would have to figure out a way to give him uh, 15 faders, you know, that is the whole mix. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, there's, you know, you have your live orchestra, you have your sample orchestra, which I call the, your dead orchestra. Mm -hmm. you, you, you figure out what the food groups are that's going to be able to give you the ability to mix. So maybe it's the fact that you're separating out the live stuff and the non-live stuff, or maybe mm -hmm. it's the fact that you're separating out the long stuff and the short stuff. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's always going to be a way to create yourself a, a smaller um, mixing environment where it's easy to grab faders. I'm telling you, if you were to come to my mix with 700 tracks, by the time I get to that, you'd be amazed at how easy it is to mix because, you know, not only do I do it in, in the session, but now with my S six and even at home with my S three, mm -hmm. um, I build these layouts. I spend a tremendous amount of time building layouts to where every layout is a new environment I can work with. So, with, without even thinking about it, I can go from a very intense, like where I call my God layer, which mm -hmm. is my all fader. And then there is a VCA for every single stem I'm going to make. So in this case, you know, I have my all orchestra, all perk, all synth, mm -hmm. all else. And then my orchestra level might be orc one long, orc two short, orc three mm -hmm. low. Or, and then I'm on that layer and, and then my percussion layer and all that stuff. So at that point, I'm not really, it's not hard anymore. It's just music and I'm just mixing music. But, and then but, I always have my dialogue and effects uh -huh. right here. Can, can you see that? Yeah. So and that, then, and that, so you have a temp of the dialogue and effects that you can reference as you mix the it's music. It's either a temp or if it's far enough down the field, it's pretty much, oh, it's very close to being finished. Okay. And then I have the, the demo. This is very important. Hold on, wait. I have the dev, the, what we call the mock-up, which has been approved by the director. Okay, okay, the ref and mix. What, the, well, it's the ref, it's the ref mix, but it's even more. Mm -hmm. And then I have my mix, and I spend a massive amount of time making sure that my mix does not go outside of whatever the boundaries are on this particular film from the the, the mock-up. So, if it's a purely orchestral movie, it's going to be different in the sense that everything's been replaced, but I got to make sure the balances are somewhat similar. But if it's a hybrid score, you know, my bass drum can't be 6 dB louder. My snare drum can't be 6 dB louder. It basically has to fundamentally be the same piece of music, just better and bigger and wider and more surround and, you know, yeah, we, all, we, all that stuff. We deal with the same thing. It's like, I know, I know you do, yeah. I like, I like the demo better. I'm like, uh, Yes, sure. Let's do that. Yeah, uh, but the thing is, if you know that going in and you respect yes. that and you don't try to show them, oh, I can do this better, but yep. you play with it. Like I say sometimes that sometimes all I do is change it 5%, right? Mm -hmm. But it's the right 5%. Correct. You know? And that 5% could be 100%. That 5% could change everything. If I can mm -hmm. extend like the warmth of a piece of music to be – to, you know, to wrap you in its warmth, I don't have to change the balances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this is really absolutely fascinating. Um, there's a, but there's a, um, there's an arc to getting to to have the consciousness you have. There's a certain arc of learning. Like if if we say if you didn't have uh, this, you know, seven hundred twenty thousand movies under your belt. And uh, I dropped you on the score of Mission Impossible Seven, which is uh, in your discography. Mission and Impossible Two, I didn't Mission do Seven. If it's in there, it's wrong. I didn't. Oh, okay. Do oh, okay. am I in it now? Yeah. It oh, says maybe I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah. It says music uh, announced scoring mi uh, mixer for Mission oh, Impossible be... Seven and Mission Impossible. I just I just got you a gig. I might have a gig. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, it, this, this, the ability to to wrap your head around the process, this this workflow you have developed that developed over the years. How did you learn? Right. You you taught yourself how to do this. Nobody goes to school for this, or maybe go to school now. But you basically invented this workflow, correct? 
Well, I, yes and no. I mean, I, I invented my way of doing the workflow, but when I first started out, we were, they were doing stems and it was all that. And, and uh, I walked in, you know, when I first started in 94, we were delivering basically uh, on, on ADAT or on uh, what was the task M one? DA88. DA88. We would deliver our 16 tracks on DA88 with, you know, sometimes it was three mixes, sometimes it was five mixes. We'd figure out a way to do it. And it was, we were delivering 16 track and it just got bigger and bigger. And, you know, maybe I did, I helped sort of develop the, the procedure that I don't know if I helped develop it, but, but, you know, certainly for the way the films I work on with the intensity and the complexity of it, you know, I had to come up with a system that worked. And a lot of that was collaboration with, with uh, really, really great assistants through the year. You know, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of fantastic assistants and we would sit there and beard stroke. How are we going to get this to work? How am I going to get this on the console? How am I going to be able to listen to this? How am I going to be able to play this back and all that stuff? You know, in the old days, you couldn't do it. So you would have, if I had to deliver really wide, I'd have to, do, I'd have to print and pass it. So mm -hmm. say I had a layout that enabled me to have eight stems, right? Well, if I need to deliver 14 stems, then I would have to turn off half of the shit, print the first half, turn off the other half, print the second half, and then compare, go back and forth between the full mix to make sure nothing got screwed up. And 40% of the time, something got screwed up. Mm -hmm. So I made a decision. Once Pro Tools started getting good enough to really be my full-time work environment, I said, I'm never going to print multiple passes again. So this workflow, this, this, this sort of advanced workflow is something that we developed through the time. And we added another rig so that we could print on a separate rig. We, you know, added a third rig so that we could have the solos coming out separate outputs. We added another IO and stuff like that and just built it up. And then right when whatever, whenever uh, HDX happened and we were able to get 720 voices and the computers got better and the, con and, you know, in the old days, I used to use outboard converters. I spent a shitload of money on converters for recording orchestra. And then when they got Ed Meitner to help to develop the HDX converter and mm -hmm. the Pro Tools converter started sounding good, I just turned all that stuff off, you know, and just started working the simplest way possible so that I could spend my complexity on the stuff that needed it, which yep. was in the signal flow inside of Pro Tools. Yep. You know. The simpler, and, the better. And, and, you know, Pro Tools has the advantage of of, uh, you know, you do have a, a, an HDX environment where you're not working in native. And so uh, yeah, I can offload a lot of the tasking to my cards or my UAD cards or yep. Waves has their uh, server. And Sound great. You know, now Mech DSP has their server and everyone's getting their servers now. That's become a very important part of it so that we can get stuff off of the computer and it's making it even easier to do this you know i'm i'm mixing pretty big stuff at home right now i'm you know 21 7.1 stems on a mac mini with three hdx cards that's pretty cool that's amazing the yeah. um avid has developed stat, strat, um, technology i think it's called satellite that allows you to sync several rigs together absolutely right? yep yep i don't that's use good. it at the moment but that's only because i've already invested in so many other things mm -hmm. that um uh sorry i just got lost in an email <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for I'm, I'm waiting for queue approvals, folks. Yep. We have this so. we have this queue in this movie, Joe Trapanese that uh, he's fantastic. That's made up of two different uh, versions, and I've had to mix both versions. And I'm waiting for approval on both versions so I can deliver them the stems so that they can do their edit. <laughs> so uh, Alan, Alan, I'm, Alan is taking uh, some of his precious time to talk to us, but I'm going to make sure we're very focused and we don't, we don't, um, yeah. you know, keep and, him away. And I'm from bad me. at that. I'm bad at yes, that. So you me too, because I could, yeah. I could talk to you about this stuff for. That's my assistant everything. engineer. Right What's there. up? That's Luigi. Yeah, three -legged I, think, dog. I think I think Luigi is actually your picture on IMDb. Yeah, it could uh, be. No, that's yeah. my old dog Monty. Oh, okay. Yeah, Monty. Monty is no longer with us. Okay, he's watching movies from above. So, sure. uh, so uh, let's um let's take a, let's take a first question, which this is yeah. a very interesting question, and I get that question um, uh, also for us since. Um, Hi, Alan, says Joachim. Um, how do you approach sample orchestra? How do you make it shine or sound more cinematic? And uh, and what do you think of the Vienna MIR Pro by VSL? 
So first, and there's something that also applies to sense. Uh, I get that question all the time. What do you do to a sample orchestra so that it doesn't sound like plastic? I always find that with uh, most of the sample libraries, there are frequencies that, that seem to pop through a little bit more through somewhere, even on the samples that I've you know designed and come out that pop through a little bit more once it gets into the sample process. So mm -hmm. I find a little dynamic EQ with samples, or I use this plugin a lot called the Gulf Os, mm -hmm. which is uh, it's it's a resampler and mm -hmm. it's constantly doing dynamic EQ made by sound theory. And mm -hmm. that helps even out the frequency structure a little bit. And then I just, you know, it comes down to the process of looking for uh, interesting reverbs and processing to make it work. If they're very stereo, 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 and I get a bunch of passes, then I take the low orchestra and I put on it some sort of clever way to pan it to the right without hard panning. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a bunch of plugins for that. Uh, Good Hertz actually has this beautiful thing called the pan pot, which you can mm -hmm. use either just lateral panning Mm -hmm. by mono style panning or using delay and they use the Haas effect to get there or spectral panning. Mm -hmm. So I'll use that and like move, you know, I'll try to pan it a little bit so that it, it sounds a little bit more organic. Mm -hmm. um, I find uh, um, that um, sample orchestras, when they, when stuff gets really loud, tends to be a tiny bit more harsh. Yep. So I, I tend to manage that using, some sort of either again dynamic eq or like oek sound has this thing called soothe mm -hmm. which is fantastic on orchestras to sort of calm that down yep. and if i and if i find that if i listen to an orchestra sample and it feels like a lot of the information is coming from the center mm -hmm. different libraries have different ways of doing that i'll mm -hmm. figure out a way to cleverly widen it either maybe use a tiny bit of ms with one of a thousand plugins that you mm -hmm. could do that with frequency based MS, like on the fab filter, where you mm -hmm. can take one EQ frequency and make it just the mod, the center and pull that yeah. down a little bit. Or I'll use some some nice widener, the leap wing or something like that. Or mm -hmm. Waves has the beautiful spectral wideners called the imager. There's mm -hmm. just a lot of ways to do that. So when I get stuff in, the first thing I do with all the samples is I listen to the space that they Occupy and if it's all sitting in the same space, I figure out ways to subtly sort of change that so that I start getting the sense of depth, even mm -hmm. though it's not real depth. And then I look for good reverbs, you know, to, mm -hmm. depending on the sound and you know what reverb I want to use. I, there's a lot of reverbs out there. Liquid Sonics is doing some great stuff. Waves is doing some great stuff. You know, there's just I hate mentioning names on these things because it's just what's in my head at the moment. Yeah. There's so many good things out there. Yeah. I'm I mean, not a big I'm not a big Altiverb guy. I, I use it. It's more a, a direct usage. Like if I need to put something in a room, mm -hmm. uh, I'll use Altiverb for that. But I don't really think of it as a reverb, a send and return reverb very often. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the 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 I think something that is a good way to to summarize what you just said is like the, it, you have the vision of what you want it to sound like. That is the thing. How do you make a, a sample orchestra sound uh, better? It's by knowing what a real orchestra sounds like, right. and then you can attain that. It's not. Right. No, it's, it's a consciousness thing. Yeah. Yes. But the vision comes from hearing what they're doing. It's not. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't have like this one set standard vision of what the orchestra sounds like in my head. There isn't like a template that like a, a, a intellectual template that I'm using. I hear what they're doing and I try to respond to what they're doing to, to make it work. That makes it sound a little bit more organic. And if organic's not the right thing, then I try to make it sound like a better version of what it is, mm -hmm. you know, using the 5% rule. The five percent rule. So uh, I think that's going to be a takeaway. So uh, let's just go deeper into geekery. What's that? I don't even know about it. What's the Vienna MIR Pro? So so if you um, it's this fantastic thing that I've I just bought it again. I had it before. I actually know the guy who designed it. This guy named Dietz Tinhoff. Um, I'll pull up uh, an instance of it. Um, basically, it's a it's a reverb or it's it's not really a reverb as much as it's a convolution. So uh -huh. um, I'm going to just set it up real quick here. Okay. Um, you have um, you have the ability to uh, put um, anything in a space like that. 
And the space can be any venue you want. So I put it in the space and then I pick the venue I want. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, some of them are cooler looking than others. Uh, but if I go here, like I'm in this great, right? And now I'm picking where on the stage I want it. Now, the interesting thing about this is you can use, you can put instances of this on as many tracks as you want, but each of the instances go into the same venue. So you have one space where you're working with all of these things and you can literally, if you're if like in the world of the pandemic, you have a bunch of musicians working at home, you're getting a bunch of mono sounds. I can take each of those, put them into one venue and then decide what venue I want to use. It's complete and science then I can fiction. totally tweak it. It's really elegant. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still an amateur at it because I just got it mm -hmm. and I've been practicing with it. And I have two sure. movies coming up where I'm going to use the shit out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's very expensive, even with the deal I get. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's well worth it. Um, uh, it's a it's a great plug. -in. So it is a, it is essentially a uh, adult version of uh, Altiverb. It is well, convolution with placement it, in it. Yes, but the difference between this and Altiverb is Altiverb. Each instance you use is just a standalone instance. Yeah. This each instance you use has sort of a a a. a uh, it's the same thing um, with um, if you use the sound radix. Yeah. Uh, auto align. Yeah. Each of it's a separate instance, but they all look at each other, and mm -hmm. figure out where the, everything's supposed to go. That is. Um... That is a very interesting thing that I'm going to look into for my personal um, ed edification. Uh, yeah, cool. It's so, beautiful. And they have like 52,000 samples in there. So you can pretty much place it anywhere and it just triggers off a new convolution, all operating at the same time. Amazing. It is, it is not DSP light. I will warn you that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, that's 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 the other thing. What kind of you say you're mixing on a on a Mac Mini right now? But yeah. you have an you have a HDX three, so that helps right. a lot. And you right. have some, some probably a satellite eight eight channel. I have eight, three eight. satellites. I have twenty four chips. You know. Okay, so for, that's why for uh, UAG. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So um, okay, let's um, let's get to the next um, question. Um, when working with Hans Zimmer. Uh, the next question is from Patrick. When working from uh, with Hans, who often uses unusual or unique ensembles or groupings of instruments from project to project, for example, Gladiator, Interstellar, and Sherlock Holmes are quite different from each other and all have distinct sounds. How do you approach a mix like this versus, say, a regular orchestral mix? Is it different? Yeah, I mean, you know, Hans is look, Hans with this, Hans is a better engineer than I will ever be on certain levels. You know, he's, he, the stuff that comes to me from Hans is it's already come out of his brain and it's a pretty complete picture. And then, and I get to be part of creating that at times I might be helping develop the sound, but at the end of the day, a lot of it's that the, the, the live elements that we recorded for, like, for example, Sherlock Holmes, they went to, record all this, these Romany musicians, which I didn't go. Um, mm -hmm. But the orchestra we recorded was a pretty traditional recording at Air Studios. He uses Air Studios. Gladiator was a pretty traditional recording at Air Studios. But then there are times where we'll take a complete risk, you know, like on the Pirates, we recorded 16 French horns left and right on six foot risers. And, you know, he Hans is not above. If I go to Hans and say, hey, why don't we try this? He'd be like, you know, if he goes, no, no, that sucks. Let's do this instead. Sometimes the answer with Hans is to is to sort of give him, you know, like it's just as valid to give him what he doesn't want as mm -hmm. opposed to what he wants because it triggers the idea. That's a great way to collaborate when it works like that. Yeah. It's really I mean, fun. There, are, there are times where I've done mixes where he'll come in and goes, okay, now I know what I don't want it to sound like. You know, which is hard for the ego, but. You know, one of the quotes I always say with him very often is when, when I did the first mix on Black Hawk Down, I had just finished mixing this this beautiful score for this other movie. And 
I did this big suite. It took me three days. Everyone was loving it. High fives everywhere. All the musicians come in. Lisa Gerard sitting next to me, listening to the mix. It feels so good. I'm like, finally, I'm ready to play it for Hans. I play eight bars. He runs over. He hits stop. He looks at me and goes, darling, you're mixing the wrong movie. And he goes, turn off the reverbs. Turn off the delays. Start again. Ugh. Like, you know, um, I'm, Clear Mountain I'm, tells a story like that too, by the way. Yeah, you know, one of uh, in that at that level is more of a joke. But um, good friend Ed Cherney passed, um, yeah. and the saddest thing in the universe. And yeah. um, Love him. um, uh, he Love uh, oh, it was it's just so sad just to think about it. And Ross Hogarth tells the story where also a good friend. Yes, he's awesome. Yeah, the no uh, advances tells, to a Poltec. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's not the one. Uh, so where, where, yeah. Um, uh, so Ross was mixing, and then Ed comes in, and uh, Ross says, "Hey, so, uh, you know, what do you think?" And uh, Ross says that uh, Ed said, "Well, what I you could start by muting everything. It would sound better." <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, my so favorite Ed Cherney quote is when people talk about the gear they used, he goes, mm -hmm. look, no one ever danced to a Poltec. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So that must have been really tough. But the thing is, obviously, you know it's good feedback because you know he trusts you, otherwise you wouldn't be in the yeah. chair. So Yeah, I mean, of course. It, 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 look, I get it. And, and look, I by the way, that good feedback and being able to take that is an acquired skill i did not start with that thick of skin you know mm -hmm. i had as thin a skin as anyone else you know and it took me a long time to develop that sort of game and every now and then it's still sort of you know because there are times where you just can't get people happy you know it's just it, you, you finally i it was a, a time on a movie where i recorded los lobos for this movie mm -hmm. and i did this rough mix right and they love that fucking rough mix, man. And nothing I, which was in stereo, of course, nothing I could do after that was made them happy. And I just couldn't make them happy, you know? And it just beat me up and beat me up and beat me up until I got it. And it was tough. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard. There's, look, the, the, the thing that makes us good at what we do, the creative mind is also, there's a bit of narcissism involved there. There's mm -hmm. a bit of looking inward. Um, the thing that I've adopted through the years, and I talk about a lot, is uh, because if I was the one that judged everything, I would be a, an Uber driver today because I think everything I do sucks. Mm -hmm. So I I put the work out there the best I can, and I let someone else judge it. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's healthy. Um, so um, so let's touch on something that I wanted to talk to you about um, is which is difficult. Um, and I'm really curious to know what you're going to say. So, uh, in the in the stereo world, in the in the in the music world, we have two speakers, and we pretty much know what people are going to listen to the stuff on. They're going to listen to it on this, those shitty Apple headphones um, that are a crime a crime against humanity, or worse, Beats by Dre headphones. That's pretty much the you know that's the range. So, there's no what we hear in our monitors is not what people are going to hear but we have an idea right right you're mixing a movie that's going to be in the theater with 700 right. speakers uh it's going to be played on shitty tvs with speakers that are three inch wide uh it's going to be played in pseudo surround how right. do you wrap your head around envisioning what is what's who do you work it's for? hard but it's hard. Well, you work for the big room. You work for the, the the biggest common denominator because that's where it starts. And and uh, you know, back in the day, they were they were just you know without even listening, crashing down all those other versions. Now, they, they, they because so much of stuff happens on people's TVs and stuff. There is a post production stage where they're actually doing a real you know there's real engineers doing a real mix, listening to it on TV speakers and listening to it on small range speakers and stuff like okay. that. But, so the yet another step, uh, yet another uh, step, but you, so you, you aim for the sky, you aim for the big room, the Chinese theater in there. Yes. But at the same time, I have to take all those other things into account. So uh -huh. I know that if I make a massive low end, it's not going to make it. So here I'm doing a Netflix movie right now. Right. Okay. I have to be very careful about what my low end sounds like, because I have to make sure that my low end 
is going to translate to a TV speaker. So, so what I do is I, I sort of force the energy up the frequency spectrum a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. I'm either using a harmon a harmonic plugin, like, uh, uh, not our base, the, the, the other Max one, base. um, Max, Max base. base, Max base is a great tool for doing that. The yep. same reason you use it on, uh, on a bass and a pop song so that you can hear the bass better on your mm -hmm. aura tone or yep. on eyes, the same reason I use it. Okay. So, um, so I use, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So no, we know we know that the the Netflix people who watch Netflix, um, those who don't watch it on their laptop in bed next to their girlfriend with the laptop on their lap, not those people. We don't talk. Not, we're not friends with those people. The people who have a, a TV and say a Sonos, Sonos, what I don't know how you say Sonos, um, Sonos surround Sonos. thing. Yeah, Sonos. Yeah. yeah, that's not surround. That's that's. So now you know you can put together you can put Sonos you can absolutely build a five point one system with. Yeah, but the, the, I mean, if, if you uh, if you're doing the stereo ones with the stereo bar that's using DSP to do it, no, it's not surround. Yeah, it's not it's not bad though. I mean, honestly, I, I actually, I, I, I I'm I'm Sonos is I'm part of that family. So, mm -hmm. um, I Sonos love it. has been is, Sonos has been a big step up. I you think know, so now the, the Apple speaker, you know, with, for low end, Sonos has been a big step up. There's some Absolutely. good low end coming out of Sonos. But but, but it uh, must be terrifying to know that you're gonna yeah. where, where you're gonna play something yeah. and it's gonna sound completely different because the Sonos drives me is crazy. It still drives me <laughs> crazy. It drives me crazy. I mean, this this like when you come out of the TV speakers and you get this big low end and their and their broadcast compressor is just killing it, and you start hearing this cardboard paper. You hear it on pop records all the time when they stick a song in a movie and and it just nothing. It just doesn't hold up. And it's just you know like if I had done that mix, I might have been able to do something about that. But that's just. It's just the way. I mean, I don't know what to say about that. It's I, I, I know that there are people smarter than me that have dealt with this more, and are getting better and better at it. And it's getting better and better all the time. And and I can take it into account somewhat, but but there is a point where I have to let it go, and just know that you know trust that that whoever's going to be downstream and responsible for that is going to take that into account. And, you know, a lot of the problem is that they they just want to print like everything else louder is better and they still they run their commercials still louder they don't follow that standard for their commercials so so they turn it up if they would turn the commercials down 8 db and and then print the music at a reasonable level everything would sound better yep same same everything same. would sound better yep if if apple would turn on uh the the level normalization by default in itunes there would be no more loudness for it be gone but that's not the world we live in Right, right. Uh, because everybody else is is leveled, and um, you know, uh, titles, Spotify, YouTube is at minus fourteen yeah. and UFS. There's plenty yeah. of room, plenty of room, but yeah. not yet. You know, we need Apple to to turn it on. And then see, but the thing is, with you with minus fourteen LUFS, and that's great. But you're with pop music, you could pretty much put the entire song at minus 14 LUFS you probably, and you might have I a, put two of them. <laughs> yeah, you probably have a three or four dB dynamic range, right? Uh -huh. Films don't have that. We can't do a three or four dB dynamic range because the explosions have to be loud compared to the quiet stuff. Or if you if you start a scene that's quiet and then it gets big, you lose that effect. So you have to you have to factor in a larger dynamic range when it comes to film and it makes it very, very difficult because they so want everyone to hear the dialogue when it's quiet. And they want everyone to feel the explosions when it's loud. So it's, I, I don't really know the solution. You know, I have friends at Netflix now. A lot of the people I work with have now work work at Netflix, and we 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 have this conversation on Zoom calls a lot about how to make it better. I have this conversation on this side with labels, with mastering engineers. I'm I'm for, for just for music to try and and uh, make music sound less bad, uh, but uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, not not this See, week. Uh, I'm a, I'm a weird guy. I kind of think music doesn't sound bad now. I listen to what the guys are doing today, and I think that you know the guys and women doing it today are really great mixers. You know, oh, there's I, a lot of great content. But if you heard it before mastering, you'd be I, I understand that. I, understand um, that yeah. I hear my records coming out of Spotify. Yeah, and I'm like, what? What happened? 
you know it's just like why and it's unnecessary um but you know that's a different discussion let's not go there i mean let's i'm mixing an album i'm mixing an album now um i don't even know if i'm allowed to announce this i'm mixing an album now for a major edm artist okay okay and we're doing an acoustic album we're doing an orchestra and a band and everything like that mm -hmm. and it sounds very very acoustic it sounds very jackson brown in the 70s with an orchestra kind of thing right wow and when i put it up against you know but with with edm beats and grooves and stuff all just played live you know mm -hmm. and when i put it up against modern records that's very hard for me because i can't without really messing it up i can't compete you can't go there and you shouldn't uh, um well that's because... the, that's been the, the discussion on on this project is should i go there or shouldn't i go there because everyone says no don't go there but then everyone wants it to be as loud as everything else well let's talk offline i have a solution for you okay <laughs> i'm developing something. you mix it for me and make it sound better because no, no, you're no, probably no. better at this i would then well i do have to deal with it every day um sure. here's an interesting i love this question hi alan says hi someone who didn't leave their name um could you name three songs slash pieces of music which had or have a significant impact in your life and why let's not do three let's do two that's a tough one right i should have warned you about that i don't i don't know about two i don't think okay I how, about, how about 53. um uh it's not going to be what you guys think it's that's okay that's, that's why it's going to be fun hit it kind of blue i mean literally kind of blue i uh, miles davis record i i can't tell you how many times i've listened to that record through the it yesterday you know yeah. I, I just um um uh steps ahead modern times so i need wow. to tell you a story i need to tell you a story about that why that is the case because yeah. i developed an incredibly important friendship with michael brecker in the early 80s that oh, probably wow. saved my life and uh it might not have meant that much to him but it meant a lot to me and part of that was they were doing that record at skyline which was where I was mixing. I was, I just mixed Brian Ferry's record there. I was doing Robbie Neville's record there. And, and uh, so I got to sit in and watch them mix that record a little bit. And that record went on to just be so meaningful in my life because of my relationship to Michael. And then Michael passed away in 2006. Yep. So, um, and I'm a huge yes. jazz yes. lover. Who mixed and, that record? Who mixed that record? Uh, James yeah. Farber is one James of the best. Farber. He recorded yeah. it and mixed it. One of the so best good. jazz mixers on the planet. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, Yo-Yo Ma's Bach Cello Suites, because for eight years, I put my son, who's now 19, to sleep listening to that record every single night for eight years. Uh, Steely Dan, Gaucho, because I assisted on it in Asia. Uh, I don't know. It's really hard. I mean, where do you start and stop? There's music to me. I, I don't. I, it's hard for me to list to say what my favorite music is, because music is so important in my life. Um, I mean, I go down roads, like I've been down this John Coltrane road recently because there was a documentary and yep. just re, re you know, rediscovering that. And I listen to a massive amount of classical music. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite engineers, this guy, Richard King, you should listen to anything that this guy records and mixes. He is a genius and uh, everything that he does is the way it should sound. Um, you know, he's Yo-Yo Ma's engineer. Oh. Um, uh, but then the old stuff, you know, like my, the, the, all the stuff that I grew up with, James Taylor, Sweet Baby James, Carol King's Tavistry, Tommy, you know, that's the music of my era growing up. All those early Return to Forever records, Romantic <laughs> Warrior, uh, Music Magic, the early Mahavishnu records, you know, all that. I totally got into the jazz rock, you know, fusion thing. So the Brecker, the early Brecker Brothers records, long before I ever met Michael, all that stuff. It's just, you know, I, most of the stuff that I'm naming is instrumental music. Yes. Which is why I wasn't the best pop mixer in the world. And I'm a much better film score mixer because that's the stuff that gets me hard, you know, mm -hmm. is, is, uh, you know, great, you know, all that fucking fantastic Chick Corea stuff and Keith yeah, Jarrett and the, the sound, the sound of those Rudy Van Gelder movies. 
Um, the, the records, uh, yeah, the records, record yeah. Is yeah. Unbelievable. Unfathomable. Unbelievable. It's just right. unbelievable. All done in his house in Elizabeth, in, New Jersey. In New Jersey, in a basement, basically, yeah, right? Basement. Or, yeah. Well, he eventually built his own studio, but that's where it started, was in a basement, yeah. Yeah. All produced by a friend of mine's father, Bob Field. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, those records have uh, such an atmosphere and a sonic imprint. Uh, and they yeah. were done with basically nothing. But nothing. You know, if you look at the making of Kind of Blue, it was done at CBS 30th Street when it existed, the same studio they did Dave Brubeck mm -hmm. on the same piano that Bill Evans played on Kind of Blue, Dave played on Take Five. And they used seven Neumann M4, uh, 49s. That was it. it. The whole yeah. record, seven Neumann M49s. All, you know, and the beauty of that, why does that sound so good? You know, it's like, well, I can tell you why it sounds so good, because they were fantastic sounding microphones mm -hmm. and they were placed far enough apart that they weren't getting phase mm -hmm. inconsistencies and, and, you know, combing effects of each other because mm -hmm. there were only seven. You know, so when you get more mics, it gets harder to make things sound that clear and that pure. You know, the, there was one. The room was awesome. Unbelievable room. And the mics were yeah. probably the mics were probably in omnidirectional. Al Schmidt yeah. always uses mics in omnidirectional yeah. when he can, you know, yeah. for capturing a good room. So you have one on the piano, <laughs> one on the bass, one on the trumpet, two tenors. You know, who am I leaving out? It's two on the drums. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Two, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, if you guys um, who are watching don't know that record, or you know that record, everybody knows that record. Uh, but how biggest you selling jazz record ever. You know that, <clears> right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know. I do. I fr um, there was a, a time where I thought I'm a saxophone player. What do you play? Trumpet. Trump. So there was a time where I was going to be a trumpet player because I fell yeah. in love with Chad, Chad Baker. So I transcribed the. I transcribed every Chad Baker solo. Uh, on the on the Jerry Mulligan and uh, Chad Baker record, and then yeah. when I was done with that, then I went to transcribe the the solos on the on Kind of Blue on trumpet, and then I failed. So then I transcribed it on saxophone. So that record, failed. Yeah. So that record is is pretty much. So you might not know this about me, but you but sure. you'll enjoy this. Is when I was 19 years old, I was working in a studio in the outs in the outskirts of Waterloo, Belgium, and the big mo thing about that for me was I got to record and mix a Chet Baker album. <gasps> and if you look at the record, I'll send you the picture. You they, they take a picture of everyone in the studio and standing there in the back, me with my long hair and my dark glasses for camouflage, of course, in those days, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. me in the picture with Chet. That's amazing. Yeah, it's great. It was like it one is, of my first experiences. Check this out. 19 years old. My first ever experience was I was assisting Vincent Maé, who's a fantastic engineer in um, in France, recording Chet live at the New Morning. Wow. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. I could I probably was find the there. picture for you. Yeah, I, wanna... I mean, that was part of my early story. You know, it was just, a, it was it was an incredible opportunity to, uh, to wow, yeah. you know, work with one of the great, great he know, was geniuses. The, he, here's, yeah, he was, he here's was the, the best. picture. Can you see it? Yep. That's so awesome. That's me. That's me. Yeah, and, and that's Chet. amazing. It's Chet. <laughs> Unbelievable. That record with Jerry Mulligan is incredible. Um, so my yeah. my second wife, her mother, was married to Jerry Mulligan before she married this other guy who was uh, my 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 ex wife's father. She was married. Her first husband was Jerry Mulligan. Wow. And her best friend's first husband was Chet Baker. Oh my goodness gracious! It's a small wow. world. Yes, and I, you know, I being a trumpet player, I ended up being Herb Alpert's engineer for fifteen years. So I got, I learned. I mean, you want to talk about just going to school with a guy that made not only yes. in his own career made one hundred and fifty million records that sold, but yeah. produced and owned the label with. I, I learned more, and I still talk to him once a week. I learned more working for him than anything else in my life about what music is, not how to make, how to use technology to make music, but what is music? Yep. Yeah. It's, um, it's, um, and that's what gets lost a lot um, in these conversations, which is why I really enjoy talking to you is because it's, I mean, 
we you and I can geek out till the end of the day forever. I know. Um, I know. But but it always comes from the right place, which is what is it going to do on the mu to the music and and how um, how is that relevant to the music process? It's not geeking out. It's not ha adding a plugin because it's another plugin that looks pretty. It's because it's going to solve the problem to make the music more palatable. Right. To Which is why I always my last step is always about music. I do. I geek out in a session and get it all done. And then usually I put it away and come back to it when all it is is music. It's no longer plugins. It's no longer routing. It's no longer layouts. It's mm -hmm. none of that. It's just me and a piece of music and a fader, you know, yep. or a volume or a volume graph. If it mm -hmm. needs to be that, you know, so it's right. Yep. It's just all about music. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And it's easy to lose track of that, uh, especially because um, we have to deal with so much technical stuff, uh, so much more than we used to. Things are getting a lot yeah. more technical. And so for movies, there's been a, a revolution. Uh, there's a revolution on the way, thanks to Dolby. Um, and everything is going at most. Um, uh, and actually, it's happening for music quite a bit. Like Steve Jenwick is mixing a lot of Atmos stuff for music, not for movies. Um, how did that come to be, and what did it do to your workflow? Did it change something, the whole Atmos thing? Yeah, I mean, I started mixing in Atmos a couple of years ago. I, I installed Atmos in my room uh, as much as I could in my small room. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it just, it, it, to live in the immersive world is is a lot of fun. It gives you just another palette to work with. Mm -hmm. you know, now you have height, now you have, you, you have all these extra things, and it started opening up just sort of the, the, the ideas, I think that Atmos is still the Wild West a little bit. I think that people are using it in different ways. Uh, you know, I don't use it like a pop. You know, a lot of these great mixes that are coming out, these pop mixes that Elton John is a great version of Rocket Man that's done in Atmos and stuff like that. I forgot the name of the guy that mixed it. You know, my, my buddy uh, uh, Steve uh, Jenowick is doing tons of stuff for, for Atmos with music only. But... Um, you know, I'm I'm a little more subtle with it. I just like the immersiveness of it. I don't want to like really play with tricks about where stuff goes. I don't really automate panning. I leave that for the sound effects guys and stuff like that. I pretty much want to create a static environment, whether it's in stereo, surround, or Atmos, and mm -hmm. let the music live there. Unless there's a specific reason, I'm moving stuff. You know, like um, but um, it's just a it, you know Atmos is is fantastic. I I don't I love it. And at the same time, it's 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 a pretty good storytelling environment. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a completely new world, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. It just basically it's it's what you used to do in surround, but with added if we want to ultra simplify, it's the same as same concept as surround, but with added height height information. With with added height information. So yeah. now you can actually pull things off the stage somewhat. You know, that with that most making things float in midair is, is not that good. There isn't quite enough uh, real estate to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. RO3D does that a little bit better, but Atmos does a lot of other things better. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's not just Atmos, there's RO3D also. And yep. Back in the day, we used to have other formats too. They went away, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's fun to, you know, I, I did this movie Gemini Man with Ang Lee. And mm -hmm. the reason I got the gig was because he heard the mixes I was doing on Lion King which were in Atmos, and he wanted that sort of environment for his movie because he shot it in super high res. He shot it at 120 frames per second. And uh, so so 128 frames per second, I'm sorry. Uh, and um, and uh, so he heard what I did with Atmos and thought that I would be the right guy for mixing that movie. Um, and he came to the mixes every night. So that was an opportunity for me to use Atmos in a little bit more dramatic way. But still, I found myself finding space for things and and letting them live in that space as mm -hmm. opposed to moving stuff around yeah i i'm i'm with you i find that unless there's it, for music i find that vulgar when stuff moves and back in the day when I do too. when five one was going to be the next thing for music there was dvd a remember the dvd audio oh, stuff yeah. oh yeah uh i was like and and i listened to a few things i remember a remix of a steely dan stuff yeah. and i remember and i just I, I know. Don't like it. I know. The one I did like in those days, or actually earlier in the quad days, was um, he passed away. The guy that did, he did a, a quad version of Dark Side of the Moon. 
Oh, I know who you're talking about. He had a, he had a plug-in brand too. Uh, he was an engineer, and then he had a plug-in brand. I, I forget it. Um, Maybe he didn't pass away. I think yeah. Mike Shipley is who I'm thinking of, but he yeah. passed away. But I don't think Mike that's who passed, did that yes. mix. Yeah, you know who's very good at that is Elliot China. He does. Elliot's great at it, you know. But but and I love Elliot, and mm -hmm. I love him because I can agree to disagree with him about the way that we use that format. Mm -hmm. You know, Elliot, the, the, of course, the, the record that made all this start was Hell Freezes Over. And that was Elliot's yeah. mix. And yeah. every singer, every singer is in a different speaker. And yeah. it's a lot of fun, but that's just not, I don't go there. You know, it's just. Yeah, it, it's a, it, it can get gimmicky over time. Yeah. Uh, but it's a really interesting thing to, 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 ima how can I put this? We're so used to, to stereo on, yeah. for music um, yeah. that then when you expand it, it no longer feels natural when in theory it should be more right. natural. Right. Stereo See, I'm natural. the opposite of that because I'm so used to surround music that sometimes I feel very constricted by stereo when I listen to things in stereo. Well, it is, that's it why is. I like going back to those early recordings and Coltrane and stuff like that because mm -hmm. that's where stereo works great. You know, yep. when they are done in stereo, most of them are actually mono. But And yeah. those early scores, you know, those early Bernard Herrmann scores, yeah, the early days of stereo were really great. Yeah, listen, yeah. I got to start wrapping this up because I, I know get back to work. That was my transition, uh, but you're doing it better than me. So, um, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, please fill the uh, comment stack with an in amazing amount of thank you for Alan to take an hour <laughs> and a half or almost two hours out of his time to chat with us because that's very I'm kind get of him. Shot. <laughs> thank you, Toby. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Andreas. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alan, for your time and for your wisdom and for sharing it with us. We really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. And then, um, and I hope that your Netflix uh, multi passes a seven one workout and your Mac Mini doesn't melt, and that um, <laughs> and that life is good uh, over there on the civil so side. So far, of the so good. I hope I, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything in Yiddish. We have an expression. It says giving a kin of her, which is basically putting a curse on something by talking about it. Right. So uh, no, I think you're going to be fine. Thank you so much, um, right. guys. Um, have a great uh, end of your day. And uh, right. of course, we'll be back here tomorrow at 2.30 for more exciting adventures. Ciao, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Ciao.